Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal here. Uh, short notice surprise interview today with uh, Professor Barry Lunt, who's based out of uh, Provo, Utah at Brigham Young University. Uh, Barry is an expert in computer storage and is uh, dedicated, um, I think Barry, right, most of your career, all your career to, uh, to this fascinating field. Um, I came across uh, Barry as one of the key participants in the MDisk revolution. Um, I've done a couple of videos this week about the MDisk. It's a archival grade storage medium that's a modified version of the Blu-ray and DVD intended for long-term storage. Uh, I've spent the best part of today burning MDisk, so it's very fitting that we're talking today, Barry. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about this, this MDisk project because it has a cult following on uh, Reddit, but um, outside of the mainstream, how many people are out there using uh, MDisk for archival storage at the moment? Well, that's definitely a good question. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I'm no longer involved in the company or the sales of the product. And so I don't really have an insight into uh, what kind of market it's reaching. Something I've, you know, I had this thought earlier in the week about storage that is kind of fascinating that, I mean, if you look at where we've gone in the last 10 or 20 years in terms of going from a floppy disk that could hold about one megabyte to, uh, you know, I've seen there's one terabyte micro SDs on the market and the hard drive market now goes all the way up to 20 terabytes. So how is it exactly that we've evolved so quickly in this respect in terms of making storage more compact. And yet, when it comes to this uh, subject of data and bit rot, which I think that probably most casual computer users aren't even aware is a thing, it seems to be MDisk is the only project that's really kind of tackled it directly. Why, 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 why is there such a discrepancy? That's a very good question. and. I it's a question that I myself wondered back when I first started working on this area of research. I think the simplest answer is that most people care about storing more and more of their data. They, they want to be able to store everything that they create and never have to worry about deleting anything. And so the pressure for sales has been to create denser storage media rather than something that will last forever because most people don't worry about that. And the cloud has certainly diverted our attention away from uh, permanence because the cloud tells us it will be there forever where most people don't, don't uh, worry about the length of the storage they just want it to be there for when they next the next time they need it you know the the thing about the cloud that you know the the adage among backup people is that the cloud isn't backup but certainly it seems to me as if m disks could be used in a modern backup approach that may be the on-site um, the on-site backup is on MDisk and then they're using cloud for off-site. So um, is, that a, uh, is that a use case that, that, that people are doing out there? The MDisk can certainly be used for backup purposes as well as local storage. There's no, nothing that prohibits it from servicing both communities. However, the MDisk was designed as a DVD, which is a capacity of 4.7 gigabytes, which back in 2008 was a substantial amount of storage. That's when we came up with this. Uh, we followed on with the Blu-ray, which is 25 gigabytes, <clears throat> but we have not been able to increase the capacity of the disks. Uh, we would prefer that they store a terabyte. Uh, so they haven't become a mass storage device simply because we can't increase the density for reasons that I don't know that we want to get into. Uh, so they work well for local storage because people's storage needs are relatively small, but compared to uh, an enterprise, needing to store terabytes, uh, the capacity is just not there for optical disks. Regarding, you know, verbatim and these other manufacturers, so are they, um, how, how does it work exactly? Because Millenniata is no longer in business, right? So these guys have the trade secret or, you know, how, how does it work exactly that other manufacturers are manufacturing uh, M-Disks nowadays? The arrangements were made before Millenniata went out of business for verbatim to license the technology and therefore manufacture the M-Disc under license from Millenniata. So the, although the company is no longer operating, the license remains in, in effect. So yes, verbatim is a licensed manufacturer of the M-Disc. Uh, inorganic layer, can, can you just try explaining for those who haven't heard of M-Discs, uh, what is it that makes um, M-Discs different than your average uh, DVD or Blu-ray? Yeah, that's another very good question. One that I was asked many, many times back in the day. 
So recordable optical discs are quite different uh, than the ones that you buy in the store. Let's say that I buy a CD or a DVD or a Blu-ray disc in the store that has content on it, such as a movie or a, a concert or something like that. When I buy that disc, it is made by a very different manufacturing process in terms of the materials that are used as compared to recordable optical discs. So if I buy it in the store, it already has a content on it. I cannot change it. I cannot override it. Uh, it's it's immutable, and actually those discs will last a very long time. The estimated lifetime on that, based on some studies by the Library of Congress, is over a thousand years. Well, that's wonderful. That means that we, we know how to make something that lasts a long time, we just don't know how to make a recordable. So if I wanted to record something by that process for my own personal use, I would have to buy a million dollar machine. So that's not practical. So I buy an optical, di uh, optical recordable disc, and the poster that I sent you has at the bottom of it a, a confocal microscope image and a scanning electron microscope image of a recordable optical disc. On the left side, you can see the marks. You can see the ones in the zeros. On the right side, you see no marks. You just see the trenches, or tracks as we call them, of the optical disc. And you can't see the physical data. So the point of that picture is that when an, a recordable disc is recorded, it, the laser impinges on the dye that is in each of the tracks and causes that dye to be less reflecting. So you see the dark spots and you see the light spots in the image there. And so those are the ones and zeros and that's been changed by the laser of the optical disc recorder. But those, per those uh, images are made, or excuse me, those marks are made in a dye that is organic. And of course it has to be a light sensitive dye, which means if you store these discs in the light, the light itself will, ca will cause further degradation. So you need something that's, that's not light sensitive and is also not changed by temperature and humidity. On the image of the poster that I sent you on the right is a scanning electron microscope picture of the M disk. And you can see the dramatic difference. You can see, clearly see the ones and zeros. So what we've done with the laser is we've ablated the recording layer. It's no longer an organic dye, it's inorganic, which means it's not subject to further degradation by environmental issues such as temperature, humidity, and light. And, uh, and of course, you know from that, your reading that we've done tests of that. We, the Naval Weapons Research Center in China Lake, California, did tests on our M-Disc compared to the very best recordable optical discs using accelerated aging, including light, temperature, and humidity. And our discs came out unscathed, literally unscathed where all the others came out either dead or the number of errors went up exponentially and they were almost un unrecoverable. So the, yeah, the difference is the recording layer, the material that's used to absorb the laser light and the way that the laser light changes the recording layer. So in our disk, those changes are physical and permanent, irreversible. Um, I, you know, I saw a video on the Melaniata page that you were on a hike and you saw hieroglyphics carved into stone. Can you just tell me about that and, and how that provided inspiration for this uh, means of writing data? <laughs> That's a wonderful story. I very much enjoy telling it. Yeah, I was uh, not too far from where Provo, Utah is, is a place called Nine Mile Canyon. It's, I guess it's about an hour and 45 minutes away. And when in 1996, I had a chance to take a group of 16 and 17 year old youth to that canyon for a couple of overnight campouts. And one of the features that drew us to that canyon were hieroglyphs, excuse me, not hieroglyphs, petroglyphs. Petroglyphs, by the way, means marks made on rock, petros, rocks, uh, by the Indians, the Anasazi Indians that were there uh, two, 3,000 years ago. We don't know for sure how far, Fremont, or Anasazi or Fremont Indians. And so the first time I ever walked up to one of those and got to see it and touch it, you can see that what the what the marks are is that the rock face has been aged by the sun and the weather over millennia and darkened. And if you chip away a thin layer, about a millimeter thick is all, of that dark layer, you expose a light layer of rock. So when you look at the petroglyph, you can see that it's made by a chipping process where you remove the dark layer and expose a light layer. And my mind immediately thought, oh, that's just like optical disc. That's how we record data on optical discs is an optical contrast, light spot and the dark spot. And I thought, oh, you could do that with lasers. And, and I didn't think anything of it until 2005 when I was making 
a backup copy of my digital pictures because I finally had a digital camera and I thought these pictures are precious to me. I wanted to make a copy of them. And I realized, well, I can't, uh, copying it from a hard disk drive to another hard disk drive is kind of like taking something that's in a glass bottom leaky boat and putting it in another glass bottom leaky boat. Meaning if the boat hits a rock, it's going to break and fall apart and crash and so everything's lost and it leaks so that eventually the boat is going to sink because it's leaking. And I thought, well, okay, that hard disk drive is rather not a very good way to do that. And I realized that optical recording discs, of course, were not permanent as well. And then I knew that we about had flash drives, but I knew that flash drives weren't permanent. And that's it. Magnetic, optical, and uh, solid state or flash drives. Those are the only three technologies we have, and none of them were permanent. And so I thought, phew, uh, this probably matters to other people too. They want some permanent way to store their digital data, and that's what got us involved in starting the research and later the company Millenniata. Could you share a little bit about what M disks are being used for nowadays? Who's buying these things? Would it be sort of governmental, archivist? What the what are the typical uh, use cases nowadays for uh, M disk storage? Yeah, so my understanding is that the typical use case now is backing up data for long term storage, or what we call offline storage. Uh, sometimes called cold storage, meaning that it's data that does not need to be regularly accessed, which is the typical use case for individuals, for non-commercial entities. So if you or I, for instance, want to store something that we want to pass on to our grandchildren or great-grandchildren or further generations beyond that, before computers, we, we would do that simply by writing it down in ink. Ink on paper will last thousands of hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So that's a permanent way to pass that kind of stuff on. But op, or excuse me, digital data is quite different than that. And none of the technologies until the MDISC were capable of storing it for hundreds or thousands of years. So the typical use case is that you and I could record whatever we wish on the MDISC, put it in an attic, die, and then when our great grandchildren find about it, find it, assuming they have a drive that will read it still in those days, uh, the data will still be there. And that's the only use case that uh, that we envisioned at the time, but it certainly found some adoption in commercial enterprises as well. So Barry, are you aware of other projects that are kind of uh, like the MDISC? We're talking cold storage uh, for long-term um, archival use, or is MDISC the only project of this nature? Yeah, so we envisioned two other different markets, or two products rather. One was what we call solid state storage, and the, second, uh, the other one was magnetic tape storage, but not magnetic, but it would be optical tape. Uh, so what we were doing was looking for ways to take the kinds of storage media that we have today and make them permanent. We did not find any way to make a hard disk drive permanent because of the ways that hard disk drives fail. Their, their technologies are like a glass bottom boat. They, they leak a bit and they are very prone to catastrophic failure. And that's a mechanical issue, and we were not able to resolve that. But we did come up with permanent solid-state storage. We have uh, some patents on that. And that means that we take transistors, as we have in integrated circuits, and we take a fuse. And we're all familiar with fuses. You know that a fuse that, uh, that is intact will conduct electricity, and a blown fuse will not conduct electricity. Well, that's what we call contrasting states, or uh, an intact fuse and a destroyed fuse. So we can call those ones and zeros and make those into bits. And the good news is that we can make those fuses extremely tiny and therefore put millions or even billions of those fuses on an integrated circuit. And that would become what we call a flash drive today. Flash drives are not permanent. They are non-volatile, but they do not last more than about 10 years. But on our envisioned product, the fuses would be blown and that would be a physical change that is irreversible. And that would last for well over a thousand years and we have patents on that, as I've mentioned, and that has been developed into a commercial product, although it is not yet completely available because the entity that has developed this is using it for their proprietary purposes and they've not released it for the market yet. So that's the solid state storage in, uh, product that we've envisioned. The other one, as I mentioned, is optical tape, and we have not developed that one at all. The uh, envisioned technology back in 19, excuse me, in 2008 would have given us a storage capacity of about one terabyte on an optical disc, excuse me, an optical tape 
cartridge like the LTO tapes that are used for backups in magnetic storage today. Uh, but that one terabyte, we don't see a way to increase that capacity where magnetic tapes continue to increase their capacity. So we've not developed the optical tape uh, idea yet. So, um, Barry, there, you know, when, when, I, when I tell my friends about my adventures in backup and M-Disc, people will look at me like I have two heads and say, have you not heard of the cloud? Um, so how would you respond to those who argue that, you know, with stuff like the ability to easily uh, put up copies of data into AWS and Backblaze, that there is no need for uh, permanent storage media anymore because, you know, the cloud has got a crazy redundancy. How, what, what would your response be to that? No doubt that the cloud is a very, very good solution in all commercial cases. By commercial, I mean, let's say if I have a company, as long as the company is in business, my company will be paying money to AWS or any other cloud provider to keep my data. But as soon as my company goes out of business, AWS is not in the business of being uh what is it, philanthropic, and giving away storage and maintaining storage for someone who doesn't pay for it. So as soon as my company goes out of business and stops paying whatever cloud service provider they were paying, that data is no longer guaranteed to be there. Well, that's certainly the case for us as individuals. If I die, I'm not going to have some kind of uh, provision in my estate probably to, in perpetuity, pay the cloud provider to store my data. It's just going to be gone. They, they don't do it just because they love us. They do it because you pay pay for it. So the cloud is a paid storage solution. They are not a, a free storage solution. Uh, Barry, let me just say thank you very much for uh, taking time uh, on behalf of all uh, MDisc fans out there um, for doing this interview. It's been very illuminating to understand a bit more about the technology, the need for it, and uh, where things might be evolving. Thank you, Daniel. It's been great to visit with you.